but we're going to talk about revival today. And the Lord just brought this message to me this morning. And it's a message that I have delivered before. Uh, probably delivered a slightly different way, but it's it's on the re revival, the coming end time revival. And there's going to be several passages here. One of them is going to be in Joel, the second chapter. Uh, and, then, and then I'm going to also uh, discuss Acts, the second chapter. And then there's, there's going to be a couple other passages that kind of flesh out some details here. So I'll go ahead and while you're turning, go to Joel, the second chapter here. Uh, I'm going to be in the 15th verse. Now I'm going to go ahead and start reading. Uh, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. And that's really what I want to talk about today is a sacred assembly. Because God gave me a dream uh, last week. And that dream said, seek him. And we sang two songs and we repeated them as our worship. Uh, the song Adonai by Paul Wilbur. And the song when we think about the Lord. Because during that dream, those two songs kept coming up. And that was why last week we focused on just those two songs. And the Lord has given me some additional revelation on that dream. He wants me to call people to sacred assembly. Uh, and let's, let's talk a little bit more about what that means. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and let the bride from her dressing room. In other words, we in other words, drop what we're doing. It's that bad. We need to seek God. And that's where really where we're at a society. Where we have a political election coming up and there are no good choices. The economy is a wreck. People have personal disasters going on in their lives. The world is in such shape that the Lord is our only hope. The urgency of the call is if you're a bride and you're in your dressing room waiting to go out to get married, postpone the marriage and go to the sacred assembly. It says here, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among their peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people. And then there's going to be two answers that God gives. The first one is going to be a physical answer. He's, he's going to give physical blessings here. Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a bare and desolate land with his face towards the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. In other words, this is saying Israel would no longer be scattered among the nations anymore because this was a, a problem with Israel. They would sin and then they would get scattered. They would sin, then they would get occupied. And God was saying, that's no longer going to be the case. This is a part of God's pattern for restoring Israel, which when, when the Jews crucified Christ, the Jewish leaders did that, part of the punishment was that they were scattered among the nations for hundreds of years. In 1948, God began that program to restore them. That program is not done because most Jews are still in unbelief. But, they, but the day will come when they will all be saved. They will accept Jesus as their Messiah. And so that program is still underway, but as, as God does that program, part of that is that they were no longer going to be scattered among the nations. He was going to drive away their occupiers. And even as we speak, there's talk of war in the Middle East. We're, we're living in dangerous times. But God has that promise that they will not be driving away, driven away. And he is calling on Israel. And he is also calling on the church to seek him in sacred assembly. And it says here, Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield her strength. 
Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come for you, the former rain and the latter rain. And now we'll talk about the former rain. And the former rain, uh, and God is talking spiritually here. And we, we skip down to verse 28. It says, And it shall come to pass afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The former rain happened in the books of Acts. In other words, there's two phases to this revival. The first one was in Acts, the second chapter. And, and in verse 1, where it talks about where Pentecost came and they were all... Uh, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Uh, this caused an uproar in town. People wonder, what was going on here? Well, Peter gives the answer. In verse 14 of Acts 2, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to him, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and eat my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The revival and acts that started the church was the former reign. But we also see in Joel here going back to Joe, that there was going to be a latter rain where God was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And you read, and I'll finish the rest of the second chapter, it shall come to pass afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming great and awesome day of the Lord. Now in the first revival in Acts, we didn't see the blood and the smoke and all that stuff. We saw the Holy Spirit being poured out. We saw people prophesying. We were prophesying. We saw people laying on hands and people getting healed. We saw all kinds of supernatural things that God was doing with his people. And we didn't see the blood and the fire because the blood and the fire and the billows of smoke are supernatural signs of judgment. And the former rain that started the church was the beginning of the ministry of reconciliation. It was God's purpose and act to send the church out to the world to tell them the good news. That Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. That even though we've all sinned and that sin deserves death, through Christ's death on the cross we can be redeemed. We can be reconciled to God. We can have that child-father relationship with God. We don't have to face Him as a merciless judge who's going to sentence us to the full extent of the law. But a loving Father. And it's because of Jesus' death that when we stand before God, we can face a loving Father rather than a stern judge. Because Jesus paid the price. But as we go towards the end of the church age, as we start, history starts wrapping up, there's going to be a latter reign. But the latter reign is about finishing what the former reign started. So because of that, there's going to be blood, there's going to be fire, there's going to be billows of smoke. All these things are things that we're seeing in Revelation. And the book of Revelation is basically one big church service as we praise God, as we proclaim God's word, as we pray, judgments fall. Judgments fall upon the earth. The organized rebellion against God is put down. Jesus returns and sets up a literal kingdom on the earth. So, and when we start reading in Joel, the third chapter here, it kind of ties both of these themes up here. It says, Behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, it says, I will gather all nations and bring them into the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's talking about Armageddon. In other words, at the same time frame that the latter reign of Joel 2 begins to fall, that's when Israel's going to be surrounded by the army. Then that's when God is going to come in judgment. So when the latter rain falls, 
there are works of judgment, which is why we see the blood, the fire, the bills of smoke. We see the sun turn dark and the moon turn red to herald the coming dreadful day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath, where he puts down all evil, and where after that there will be no more murdering, no more raping, no more stealing. And so there is coming a latter rain, just, just like that song that we, that we heard before him about the Great Awakening. The latter rain is going to fall. It's just a matter of time. And I believe that that time is short. I believe that it is coming. It, the very beginning stages of the latter rain, the beginning droplets of the latter rain, not the main event of the latter rain, but the beginning droplets, I believe, could fall this year even. God has commanded me to seek him. He has commanded me to proclaim that we should seek him in a sacred assembly. And the sacred assembly is something that has been practiced throughout the Old Testament. Uh, I'll go in just a couple of passages here. Uh, one is in Leviticus 23, and where it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. And the interesting thing about the Feast of Tabernacles is that when you read in Zechariah, uh, during the millennium and beyond, this will be an international feast. So this isn't just going to be a Jewish feast that ended because we went into the New Testament. It's going to be something that gets recycled over when Jesus returns. All nations will be observing it. Uh, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be a feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You should do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. And that's another word for sacred assembly. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly. And you should do no customary work on it. In other words, during the Feast of Tabernacles, they had seven days where they feasted the way they observed that they lived in tents. And the whole theme of the Feast of Tabernacles is it's God dwelling with us. So it's about God's presence with us. And in the historic context of the Jewish people, it's about the Lord being present with them by fire and by pillar of cloud while they were in the desert. They dwelt in tents. And so for seven days, they had to dwell in tents. They would all go to Jerusalem, they would pitch up tents and dwell, just like the ancient Israelites did when they were through the wilderness. And on the eighth day, they would have a sacred assembly. Okay? Now we see such a sacred assembly occur in 2 Chronicles 7 when Solomon dedicates the temple. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord. The fire came down. They saw the pillar of cloud like they did when, when they were in the wilderness. They saw the glory. It filled the temple. And in verse 8 it tells us a little bit about it. It says, And Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. And on the eighth day they held a sacred assembly, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days, and the feast seven days. And on the twenty-third day of the seventh month he sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart for the good that the Lord did for Israel. So there's a pattern here. Seven days of Feast of Tabernacles. Eighth day solemn assembly. Seven days of seeking God. Eighth day sacred assembly. Seven days of seeking God. Eight days of sa eighth day sacred assembly. Now, some people may think, well, this is just the Old Testament. What does that have to do with today? Well, it has a lot to do with today. Because when the disciples waited in the upper room, they followed this pattern. Let me do some math here. Jesus died on the cross. From his death on the cross to Pentecost was 50 days. He rose to dead on the third day. Then he was on the earth. He walked the earth for 40 days, according to the scriptures. On the 40th day he came up. Counting that third day, 3 plus 
40, would be 43, but counting at third day, it's 42. So on the 42nd day after Jesus died, he ascended into heaven and they went to the upper room. That's when their prayer meeting began. 42, seven days, 42nd to the 49th day, they sought God. They prayed. The eighth day of their prayer meeting, there was a sacred assembly. The fire of God came and it started the church. This is what God wants of his people today. He wants us in this latter day, and it's been nearly 2,000 years since the church began, but he wants to pour out a revival like the one in Acts. He wants us to seek him in a sacred assembly. And I don't know how I'm going to get everyone together yet, but he has given me that burden to put the message out there. And this day is the launch of it. And this message that he has given me today is the launch of it. We are to seek the Lord in sacred assembly. And this is not just something that's going to happen at Zion's Hill. Or First Baptist. Or this other church over here. Or the Bridge Community Church. This is something that God is calling in the entire Christian community. A sacred assembly in every community. Being that we live in the greater Louisville metropolitan area, I have a particular burden for the Louisville metropolitan area. But also a burden that as the folks in Louisville seek God, that this will be happening in cities all over the country. And not just in America, but all over the world. The time is short, and God is ready to move. And I have that burden to, to move and to seek Him. And to lead as many as I can persuade you to do that. And motivate them so that they will, they will lead others. And it, a very small seed, from a very small seed, you can produce a huge crop. A seed produces more seeds, which produces more. So many generations you have millions of seeds. And that's the burden that I have, and that's why I will conclude this message which today.